After independence, he really wanted to modernize this country, this nation. When the AU was established in 1963 and black and white television was introduced for the first time, so it was a very exciting time. He allowed us to visit the palace here in front. The general populace worshipped him. Haile Selassie's drive to modernize Ethiopia restarted with urgency after the Italian occupation ended and he was back in Addis Ababa. Emperor's first order of business was to create an educated class of young people who could power his country forward with their intelligence and ability to adapt to new ideas in a rapidly developing world. He started with two schools, one for secondary students and one for university pupils. He made education his priority. As a matter of fact, for many, many years, he could not trust anybody else. He himself was Minister of Education. For many years. He took it, in, I tell you, this is why he used to come in every boarding school. He was like our father, bring fruits and so on. <laughs> የትምርት ሚኒስትርነቱን sultan ይዘው አገሩን ይመሩ ስለነበረ ትምርት ሚኒስቴርን ይመሩ ስለነበረ ብዙ የትምርት ወጣቶች አፍርተዋል Today there are hundreds of secondary schools throughout the nation and over 150 colleges or universities so this was really something that uh, in different subjects she was always interested in seeing and helping people and education and so on. He was the Minister of Education himself to educate all of us actually to bring us to this level unless we forget whatever he has done. Uh, so we are his products I would say. From 1855 up to 1974, yes? This is the modern history of Ethiopia. Is that clear? Haile Selassie's crusade to create a brilliant team of young achievers helped steer his nation to where it is now. Modern education is his legacy. The other thing is that not just education, but excellence in education. He quickly grew local educators to replace foreigners. And here was a place to start his Pan-African leadership. In 1958, he invited 200 African students to Ethiopia to study at Haile Selassie University, now called Addis Ababa University. He wished to transfer his dream of modern education to the rest of Africa, but he also saw the need to engage others to promote Ethiopia's role on the continent. By bringing European diplomats, scholars and tourists to Ethiopia, he also saw a way to increase his countrymen's exposure to new ideas and develop international trade partners. But he needed to make sure they appreciated his nation. This is your first ambassador in Ethiopia. So he turned to some of the young Ethiopians he was building his contemporary society on, including Habte Selassie Tafese. Oh, I could see him any day. He was very kind with me. The emperor sent him off to Germany on Ethiopian Airlines' first flight there. 
he came back with some ideas on tourism. That was the first inaugural flight it happened to Frankfurt. Big deal. And uh, in the process, the Germans were talking about tourism. The emperor instructed him to get a tourism operation going. The emperor called me. He said, you have to do this job. I said, your majesty, I know nothing about this job. He told me, try. That reward I remember, try. It's like an order, <laughs> camouflage order. So I said, okay. Haile Selassie was always helpful in the efforts to impress foreigners, dignitaries, or ordinary tourists. If I go there, I tell my tourists, he said, bring them. I bring 10, 50, 30 tourists to him. He orders champagne. He orders Tej, he gives them to drink, they take, take a picture together, take a picture with the same lion and visit. He allowed us to visit the palace here in front. Tourists went, took pictures, they went around, look around, even his bedroom. After a few years of bringing in groups of foreigners and shooting photos all over the country, Habte Selassie coined the country's famous tourism slogan. I'm surprised you didn't ask me about the slogan 30 months of sunshine. I coined for Ethiopia. Oh, okay. It has a meaning. First of all, Ethiopia is 13 months, our calendar. And then there is sunshine 13 months a year. <laughs> Anytime. The rainy season, rain comes. All of us know that after 15 minutes, sun will come out. Ethiopia uses what they call the Gaze calendar, which is seven years difference from the commonly used Gregorian calendar, and also breaks the year down into 13 months. Another area that enjoyed the Emperor's personal touch was culture, and in particular, theater. Right over there where that bench is, it's the Emperor and the Queen were sitting right there. Actor Haimanot Alemu remembers when he was nine years old and the Emperor came to see a play at his school. He had come to see a play and uh, he brought the Queen and they both sat sort of where you are now. And uh, the play was Moliere's The Miser. Excellent actor, Makona Dori was so good. And uh, so I sat there and uh, half the time in the play, I was watching The Emperor. And uh, I saw the play, it looked simple. It looked like a simple thing to do on stage, enough to bring an emperor to our school. And that's when I decided that I want to be an actor and never changed my mind since. Hymenot's career blossomed with encouragement from the emperor and the occasional scolding. The emperor came and uh, I played the Italian collaborator, which is a character everybody loved to hate. And I have a very bad monologue where I really slam Ethiopia and Ethiopians. And he walked, he walked out of the theater and went to the palace then the three actors and the playwright were called to the palace and was, was given a, a dressing down. He was really upset. Sese was also fortunate to have the emperor take notice of him. He was training to be a lawyer when Haile Selassie caught him performing. I was um, nervous when he came, but still, I guess I was good enough to <laughs> convince him it was a, a good performance. Called me in the morning to his palace, gave me his watch, asked me what uh, my plans were. I said, I'm going to go and study law. He said, uh, I asked the minister beside him, how many students are going to study law? 
I think he answered 12. 12? Oh, that's quite a lot. So we have very many lawyers under <laughs> training. We need someone in the theater. Yeah, and so there the uh, administrators of the theater, the managers and directors were white people. They didn't speak Amharic, the, the, the local language. And so he needed you know, Ethiopians to replace them. So he said, it was a sort of an order that you go and study theater. Uh -huh. I was graciously accepted it and I don't, <laughs> I don't regret it at all. I'm very happy with the, with the profession. And when I was this, he ended up as the manager of the National Theatre, as well as starring in countless performances. His favourite was Hamlet. I played Hamlet also okay, for the Emperor. That's another great play. That was the first Hamlet. Uh, I had uh, well, what we call first European premieres by our prominent, later on prominent playwrights were staged by me. Haile Selassie stayed interested in Ethiopian theatre throughout his life. See, after him, that's what we missed. There were no leaders on, you know, on, uh, to see our productions. But he did attend uh, comedies or historical plays or um, tragedies. So he, he did. And uh, even before the Italian invasion and the establishment of proper theatres in the country, he. Uh, used to invite people who wrote dialogues or pieces of theatre to his palace for when his children got married or from wedding parties uh, and things like that. And he gave prizes to the writers and to the actors. Uh, so he was a great uh, benefactor of the arts, a patron of the, of the theatre and, uh, and the arts. Despite his pressing duties as head of state, his personal touch was always felt. The general populace worshipped him. And so you can imagine uh, him coming here and we small actors <laughs> being honoured by his presence. He usually also stayed late after the show and shook hands with us and uh, said, well, good, and, and, and left. After Ethiopia suffered at the hands of the Italian Air Force during the 1930s occupation, one might guess that the Emperor might have wanted one of his own for defensive purposes. But he started Ethiopian Airlines for different reasons. Number one was to connect his own country, which has very difficult terrain to cross. See, this is where I really caught the Emperor the Emperor's wisdom. After independence, he really wanted to modernize this country, this nation. And all the provinces were far apart. And he knew the only to connect these provinces will, will not be possible by road because of the mountains and the tarans, it's totally damn expensive. So he chose airplanes and they succeeded. He also saw the airline as a way to link Africa with Ethiopia as its center. And that really put the nation together. Yeah. And gradually, we wanted to extend this to the rest. And uh, also, 
we were very, very sure in the planning that since we are far apart from the rest of the world, we have to be independent. So we started our maintenance right away. While the early days at Ethiopian Airlines were tough financially, the effort paid off in more ways than one. The OE was started, there was no other affecting the nation. And I remember, I forgot the data now, IATA came up, but before IATA, every airline used to pay the tickets he wants to sell, for whatever price he wants to go. Then IATA came, prices were regulated. All major airlines of the world were broke. <laughs> Ethiopian airlines made money. In 2012, the company made a profit of 42 million US dollars. Connected to the rest of the world and Africa by air, Haile Selassie now became Africa's biggest champion, uniting the continent through the Organization of African Unity, or OAU. He wanted to move the continent forward in terms of trade and security to help everyone progress. He saw an opportunity to lead a post-colonial Africa from Addis Ababa to show them how a modern independent African nation could achieve great things. Ethiopia has never been occupied by the way. For five years, Italians say we are their colonies, but they were able to monitor only the towns. All the other countryside was controlled by the freedom fighters, Arbenio, you call them. And because of that, because our independence for centuries, we felt responsible to lead the rest of Africans, you know to come to that standard. Because they are new. They do not have actual governments like us in history. There were 33 uh, leaders of uh, the African nations, which had united for the first time. And this was his luck. And uh, he's regarded as the father of the, uh, of the other African nations as well. Many of Africa's independence leaders went to the emperor for inspiration, advice, and even material support. Such men as Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, and even Nelson Mandela. Many of them, they were really giving him recognition for what he has done. And we are like Kenyatta and many others, I mean like Nkrumah, we had a good appreciation about Pan-Africanism and eventually when the AU was established in 1963 and black and white television was introduced for the first time. So it was a very exciting time. So it was the kind of, the emperor I think kind of built in this appreciation of what was happening in the rest of the continent in our young minds. The OAU found a home in Addis Ababa, in part because Ethiopian Airlines could bring Africa's new leaders together here. <laughs> Having just celebrated its 50th anniversary and now called the African Union, the organization boasts many achievements achievements that would make the emperor proud. They include ending white minority rule in southern African nations, helping to create a new nation in South Sudan, 
and promoting stability in Somalia. Haile Selassie took a personal interest in promoting peace between African neighbors. Airline would prove to be crucial to his ability to go to flashpoints where his diplomatic skills would achieve dramatic results. I remember one incident, I think 1965, 66, I'm not sure of the date. Two nations were at the brink of war, Morocco and Algeria, I think. They had their troops, they are all ready. The emperor was there to the front line. We took him with the 720B. And I remember there was no jet start, you know, a car that used the, the, the pressure to start the engine. So until the emperor negotiated, we kept one engine running for six hours. And we brought peace. That's what he did. Everywhere there is a problem, he used to go there, venture. And that continued. And that was what brought Africa really to what it is. His jetting off to solve other people's problems didn't keep him from paying attention to his own family. With six children from his wife, Queen Menen, Haile Selassie had a large family to be concerned about. He wrote about uh, how he handled his families, how he uh, related with his uh, wife, and their uh, different social uh, advice. Based on that uh, advice, he wrote to his son. Uh, this is uh, my dear wife, with uh, Anos, with his, his her grandfather, my sister Lassie. Family members held positions in provincial governments, such as his grandson-in-law, Prince Mengesha Seyum. He was the first far-sighted person and uh, it was very easy for him to understand us whenever we brought problems. Of course, as a minister, I was one uh, who was very near to His Majesty. He didn't let his relatives take outsized positions in his administration or lineup of advisors. His family, Yarasa Beta Sabu Chacho, Besara Guda, I go. And then. He was worried about his wife's health, but as far as I know from the letter, their relation was very good. In the 1960s, his family would feel significant pain with the death of Queen Menen. It was a loss that the emperor would feel at home every day. Aware of his own mortality, he kept a thorough exercise regime and a consistent diet. He had uh, an exercise, he had some weight lifting, everything. He was in good shape. Perhaps at this time he was too focused on building industries and relations with his neighbors. He didn't hear the drumbeat of socialism's growing popularity across the world, in Africa and at home. Ethiopia's land titles still largely belonged to the nobility, and students wanted that changed. And a new socialist movement called the Derg eventually seized power and changed the system. Even many of the emperor's supporters were jubilant when land reform was realized. The feudal system controlled all the land, 3,000 gashas, and they're not working on it. Sit here. So were 
eager to see that. In fact, there was a demonstration way back to the university college. Meret Larashu was a slogan. Let land go to the tiller. Although I had a lot of land, I lost three gashas of land. But I want it gone because I'm not there. I'm not farming. So when the derg came and announced that one, me and my brother, eight hours who have been jumping around, I decided I'm being happy because that was justice. It must have stopped there. But things continued. You know, we're not politicians, we're just, that was the idea, being fair. But the new regime would target the monarchy. We knew that they arrested him. He was somewhere around us because they kept records there. They brought all the records, they looked, nothing, my name, nothing I got. Otherwise, I will, be, I will not be alive now to talk to you. <laughs> Haile Selassie's family members either fought or were jailed, as many were associated with his regime. My wife and my mother-in-law and uh, Princess Saragdao, the other princesses who were the four sisters of my wife. My wife was caught and I went to Sudan instead. And so I became the freedom fighter there. And uh, while the other families have been detained here for 14 years. I was eight years in prison with 56 counts. And uh, said eight years there. The first uh, few days, they came in, they said, we'll judge you according to the law. The emperor himself received the ultimate punishment. Some used to say he was shot, poisoned, suffocated. But we don't have any confirmation concerning the way how he died. Haile Selassie's greatest sin, his greatest mistake, was living too long. When the current regime eventually overthrew the Derg in 1991, Haile Selassie's body was eventually discovered in a basement find in the National Cathedral in a tomb next to his wife, Queen Menin. Here we have uh, two historical tombs. This one belongs to Emperor Halsin Lasse and that one belongs to his wife, Empress Menin. She died of natural cause 50 years ago. Gone but not forgotten, people will continue to look back on the remarkable life of Ethiopia's modern emperor.